and I better use this. Can you hear me through the microphone? Great. All right. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us on this cold evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Iver. I am the Associate Chair of the History Department, as well as Chair of its Harvey Goldberg Center. I'm consolidating all the power. in. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I would like to say a few words about the center and its legacy. Uh, the Goldberg Center is a small one and dedicated naturally to the legacy of Professor Harvey Goldberg. Uh, Professor Goldberg is one of the legends of our department. A historian of France, the breadth of his knowledge ranged widely and his performances as a teacher were legendary. Perhaps there are some of you in this room that uh, remember him. During the 1960s and 1970s, his classrooms filled the capacity. Students would audit them for no credit when they couldn't enroll. And each class ended with a round of applause, a tradition which has sadly faded with time. <laughs> <laughs> One student's bootleg recordings that I understand were carried out in the sleeve of a trench coat, uh, recorded the lectures and used to be available on CD. However, people no longer have CD players. And uh, one of my goals has been it, to make those talks available as digital downloads. The big obstacle to this is that we need accurate transcripts of very fuzzy audio recordings. So it is taking a certain amount of time. Nevertheless, I hope to have that, com that project completed by the end of the semester and ready for summer, uh, more or less 50 years after they were recorded. Uh, 50 years later, those lectures by Harvey Goldberg remain indelible in the minds of many of his students. One of the things that inspired such loyalty towards Harvey was that his analysis of the past was linked to present day political commitment. He actively supported the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam on campus and urged his students to take action. Our moment is a slightly different one. Nevertheless, the Harvey Goldberg Center's mission remains to support conversations that connect the, pre the present and the past in the tradition that he established. The past two deliverers of this lecture have been the historian Daniel Imbervoir and the journalist Adam Serwer. And the next one, most likely visiting us in the fall semester, will be the historian Bathsheba Demuth. And with that, uh, let me return to today's speaker, who belongs firmly in the tradition of our center and its lectures. Uh, Mark Philip Bradley is one of those scholars whose extraordinarily long and impressive list of career achievements uh, who has an extraordinarily long and impressive list of career achievements, but who nonetheless would probably prefer that I don't mention any of them. I will compromise by being brief about it. Uh, professor Bradley is the Bernadotte E. Schmidt Distinguished Service Professor of International History at the College at the University of Chicago, my alma mater, uh, where I met him when I was once a graduate student, a time that I remember. <laughs> I'll make sure this live with, streams back into with, the department, Patrick. So we <laughs> with fondness. I apologize for the pause. Uh, Professor Bradley is arguably too successful at administrative tasks because he keeps getting asked to do more of them. He is also deputy dean of the Division of Social Sciences and director of the Posen Family Center for Human Rights, as well as the director of our discipline's flagship journal the American Historical Review. He's the author of several books, including The World Reimagined, Americans and Human Rights in the 20th Century, Vietnam at War and Imagining Vietnam in America, The Making of Post-Colonial Vietnam, which won the Harry J. Bender Prize from the Association for Asian Studies. And he's the co-editor of several other books, including um, uh, most recently, Making the Forever War, and uh, less recently, Making Sense of the Vietnam Wars, uh, which he co-edited with Marilyn Young, another scholar that, that we would place in, uh, in that uh, Goldbergian uh, tradition. Most relevant of all is that he's currently at work on a book about the history of the Global South, and thus able to share with us today his talk, When the World Went South, the Global South in the Making of Our Times. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Bradley. You know, I want to, before I start, um, thank Reet and the administrative staff at the history department for 
getting all this set up for me. Um, appreciate that. Louise, I appreciate that you were willing to keep extending the invitation, even though it's taken a little while to, to all come about. It's 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 just been nice to hang out with you today and pleasure to be here. And and Patrick, I know what the pause is about, but good to good to, you know, get that in the mix as well. But thank you for a really nice introduction. Um, it is an honor to give the Goldberg Memorial Lecture. Um, and absolutely, Marilyn Young would be, you know, in the center of the ways in which he was thinking about the world. I mean, his work on French colonialism, his activism around the Vietnam War do remain generative for all of us who work on those issues. I noted that in one of the bios that's circulating on the web, um, he's asked what he thought were his two most impactful speeches. Um, these not, I guess, classes, but just speeches. And what I was struck by was one of them was a speech he gave in Turkey in the 1950s under the auspices of the UN. You'll see in just a bit that I'm analyzing UN speeches as a part of my project. So that was, you know, especially jumped out to me. And if that 1950 speech is somewhere on a CD or whatever, I'd be, I'd be actually curious to take a look and see it. So let me get us started by taking you back to last fall when Ade Dharmawan, who was a member of the Jakarta-based collective Ruin Grupa, found himself addressing the German parliament. Ruin Grupa had been selected back in 2019 as the artistic directors for the 15th edition of Documenta. It's held every five years in the German industrial town of Kassel, and with a budget of about $50 million, Documenta usually attracts more than a half million visitors over the 100 days of its various iterations. It is arguably the most important contemporary art exhibition in the world. Now, for those of you who are new to the art world, as I was when I began work on this project, I want to underscore the most important contemporary art exhibition in the world part of that last sentence. What happens in Kassel every five years literally shapes the contours of global visual culture. Now, you know what people say about Vegas, right? But in the case of Documenta, what happens in Kassel does not stay in Kassel. The news that Ruin Grupa had been selected to oversee the high profile Documenta was huge. They were the first Asian curators of the exhibition and the first artists as opposed to museum professionals um, to do so. Significantly, the selection of Ruin Grupa was only the second time that Documenta had been led by curators from the Global South. Since its founding in 1955, 13 of its 15 artistic directors were from Western Europe or the United States. But selecting Ruin Grupa was about more than demographics. Documenta's European-based organizing committee chooses its artistic directors, and they were worried that the whole genre of these episodic international art exhibitions had become exhausted. And they were not alone in this. Although Documenta takes place every five years, the more general moniker for these blockbuster international art shows is the Biennale. Reoccurring exhibitions usually held every two years, but sometimes every three, or like Documenta, every five. The oldest and best known of them is the Venice Biennale. There had been an explosion of new biennales in the 1990s and the early 2000s in Europe and the Global South. And there was a growing concern in the art world that the genre and the spectacle that accompanies it had become tired and too predictable. In turning to Ruin Grupa, Documenta's organizers hoped to mix it up. Where is it? No. We need Ruin Grupa. Oh, do I have to put it over here? Hmm. Let me just see over here. Yeah, there they are. Good. So, documentous organizers hoping to kind of mix up a genre that people had thought had become tired, and Ruin Grupa, as I said, happy to do so. I met the members of the collective in Jakarta just before the pandemic came down. And they were full of ideas about how their documenta would be different. Yeah, it did. Cool. 
Biennales usually feature the work of individual artists. And instead, Ruin Group had decided to elevate the presence of artist collectives like themselves who were from the Global South. They wanted to foreground and curate events that centered on what Ruin Group had termed today's injuries, especially ones rooted in colonialism, capitalism, or patriarchal structures. When Documenta 15's major exhibition halls opened this past June, there were paintings and sculptures to be sure, but also masses of video and photography-based work, along with topical collections of archival materials gathered and displayed by various activist art collectives that address questions of environmental justice, climate change, gender, sexuality, and indigenous rights. Yeah. yeah. There were also loads of installations scattered throughout the city of Kassel. Among them, this one, an intentional anti-caste and anti-racist space called Party Office that was organized by a Delhi-based collective. A musical black futurist stage floating in the middle of the river that runs through Kassel was crafted by a Philadelphia art collective and a vegetable plot of migratory plants alongside a self-described uh, queer sauna, both organized by a Hanoi-based collective. To pull these disparate strands together, Ruin Grupa borrowed from the Indonesian term for a communal rice farm. Now, I don't know Bahasa, so I'm gonna struggle with some of these names and I know there are people in the room who do, but just bear with me. Um, they advanced what they called the principles of Lumbo, a concern they said with the collective with sustainability and equity, along with a desire for dialogue and conversation. Altogether, 67 art collectives and as many as 1,500 individual artists were invited to show and talk about their work over the 100 days of Documenta 15. The day after Documenta opened in June, it all blew up. The Indonesian art collective Karang Padang had installed a 60-foot outdoor banner that was titled People's Justice. And it featured cartoon-like depictions of activists who had opposed military rule in Indonesia in the 1990s. Among the several hundred Indonesian figures on the banner, two images were troubling. One was a caricature of a Jew with side locks and fangs, wearing a hat emblazoned with the Nazi SS emblem. The other was a military figure with a pig's head, wearing a Star of David neckerchief that recalled a member of Mossad, um, Israel's security service. Now, there was a lot going on here, and I'm hesitant to show you the banner and the images in question, although if you wanna see them, they're on the web and you can find them there. But what we essentially had was a work of art about 1990s Indonesia by a self-styled progressive art collective displayed by another progressive self-styled art collective that drew in part on a variety of anti-Semitic tropes and imagery. It is, I think, the kind of disturbing and complex situation that Harvey Goldberg, in fact, would have been keen to unpack. German politicians and Jewish groups immediately denounced the banner as anti-Semitic. It was first wrapped in black, as you see here, and then removed altogether, and Tarn Pollen and Ruman Grupa offered extended apologies. But the matter didn't end there. The German administrator of Documenta resigned under pressure. A quote committee of experts was appointed to vet other work in the exhibition. And the German minister of culture, Claudia Roth, demanded an explanation for quote, how clearly anti-Semitic pictures found themselves in the exhibition in the first place. And so on the 7th of September, 2020, Ade Darmawan, as a representative of only the second curatorial team from the Global South to lead the world's most important contemporary art exhibition, found himself in front of a very angry German parliament. Ade offered an assessment of what he said were the long histories that came together to put anti-Semitic images in the People's Justice banner, an assessment that fully recognized Tarang Paling's culpability and the complicity of Ruin Grupa in its display. But he also told his German audience he believed anti-Semitic imagery had traveled to Indonesia in the first place. Colonial violence in Dutch Indonesia, Ade said, often pitted Indonesians against Chinese minorities, including the introduction of what he termed, quote, originally European anti-Semitic ideas and images 
to portray the Chinese in the ways in which some Europeans have portrayed Jews. In a shocking and shameful way, Ade continued, this has come full circle in the artwork, transformed and appropriated in our own cultural context in an unacceptable way. He ended his remarks by insisting that, quote, the global South is not something foreign to or different than the global North. Instead, he argued, it is in their interconnected cosmology that we can learn, share, and live together. The complexities of what went down in Kassel at Documenta 15 last year raise a set of larger issues that are central to my current research project, which is an intellectual history of the global South. Indeed, the contestations at Documenta help us understand that contemporary encounters between South and North have a history. We can't understand the moment we live in today without a deeper appreciation of the connected histories of the South and the North. Just as they did at Documenta, the long history of empire and the decolonial continue to hover over the present moment. But at the same time, as I will argue today, we need to be attentive to discontinuity and rupture to fully understand what it was that has put Ruin Grupa and the Global South at the very center of global thought and culture in our present moment. Something profound changed in the late 20th century. In that moment, I believe there was a fundamental ontological transformation in the concepts and categories through which, through which we understand the nature of being in the world, and that many of them first emerged in the Global South. Their origins and the way in which they traveled are the subjects of my book in progress, When the World Went South. The term Global South has often been seen merely as a kind of descriptor, a handy cartographic imaginary after the passing of the Cold War and the Third World, or as a marker of persisting and real inequalities between North and South. I wanna ask a different set of questions about the making of the South and what matters. How did we move? from the era of the third world to the era of the global south? What are the central elements that make up the revolutionary ideas and practices of the south? And how and why has the global south come to shape the world all of us live in today? When the world went south focuses on the big ideas that made up this new southern landscape and the remarkable set of people who brought them into being to tell the stories of the way in which the global south is remaking the very meanings of politics, society, and culture in our time. I'd like to do two things in our time together this afternoon. First, I wanna give you a sense of where the larger project is going and what I think it means to write an intellectual history of the South that foregrounds historical rupture. And then I'd like to turn to a slightly deeper dive into two of the intellectual histories that I'm writing. Let me begin with the bigger picture. The coming of the Global South was rooted in a set of late 20th century upheavals in world order and shifts in global consciousness. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 signaled what one scholar has termed the decomposition of the Cold War. And with it, the diminishing power of older ideas about state and society in what had been called the third world. Beneath these more familiar moments of historical change were even more sweeping ruptures in international structures and global consciousness that first emerged as early as the 1970s. In that decade, the intensification of global capitalism and neoliberal economic policies, shifting patterns of international migration, and the transnational diffusion of new technology and new media began to reorder the relationship between sovereignty and state power. It unleashed a wave of globalization that would come to undergird the rise of the global South. This same period saw a shift in who had the authority to make political and moral claims in the public sphere. Testimonial and moral witness became key words in this new era and brought the rise of new voices who centered demands for change in their own lived experience. They began to drive a new kind of politics and offer new forms of cultural expression. 
quite simply, the late 20th century was the tipping point between the global order that had shaped the world since the Second World War and the world that we live in today. It was in this hinge moment at the dawn of the new millennium that the global south began to rise. The era of the global south, in fact, opened as early as the late 1980s with popular demands for or democratic liberalization that produced with them new visions of pol political community. We saw this in Beijing, we saw it in Rangoon, we saw it in Seoul, we saw it in Johannesburg, we saw it in a variety of sites in this moment. In these popular movements for democracy, military authoritarianism, the apartheid state, and state socialism were all under attack. And with them, many of the political legacies of the eras of the Third World and the Cold War. To carve out a new public sphere for civil society, a younger generation of political activists forged a very different relationship to the colonial past than their political elders who had governed the first post-colonial states. The commitment to self, collective self-determination and well-being that marked the moment of decolonization increasingly gave way to concerns with how individuals and their families could flourish in more or less democratic societies. The politics of the Global South were also pushed forward by new social movements and Southern intellectuals who put novel ideas about sustainability, resilience, heritage, and restorative justice on the global agenda for the first time. Part of my book offers a set of connected histories of the South in the making of these new political, economic, and social vocabularies. But if Southern ideas were on the move, so too were Southern writers, filmmakers, musicians, and visual artists whose growing presence and influence began to remake global culture in the early 21st century. As late as the 1970s, the world of arts and letters had continued to operate firmly in a Euro-American order. But the late 20th century brought an unparalleled run of Nobel Prizes in literature to Southern authors, a global English language Indian novel boom, the growing circulation of Chinese and Iranian cinema, along with Bollywood and Nollywood film, the rise of Afropop and world music, and the expanding presence of visual artists from the Global South in museums and biennales. Global culture was becoming Southern culture. And in this, the visual arts were a critical site of experimentation and creativity as artists in the Global South began to embrace modes of expression, such as installation and performance, to offer fresh perspectives on individual and communal identities. Their work was disseminated through a massive expansion of museums and cultural infrastructure across both the South and the North. Today, we live in a moment when Southern creative artists, such as the Chinese-born Ai Weiwei, um, this is his career launching um, 1995 dropping of uh, Han Dynasty urn. Um, when artists like Ai Weiwei are increasingly seen as the Picassos of the 21st century. The primary source base that informs my work on when the, global, when the world went south draws on research in more than 32 archives and libraries from around the world. At the same time, I've undertaken sustained oral interviews with intellectuals, writers, and artists from the global south. My research on contemporary visual culture, for example, has involved studio visits and interviews with more than 100 artists and curators, along with immersing myself in the images, writings, and ephemera from over 60 uh, international art exhibitions. Okay, Louisa. My watch talks to me a lot, and I can't control, I can't seem to control that. Um, so that's the bigger vision of the book. And what I want to do is now touch down into two more granular examples of where the project is going. Um, how do you figure out change over time? It's a classic methodological problem for all historians, and it's one that has been central to my thinking about this project. Early in my research, I had a growing sense that I was going to write a story about change and rupture in the realm of ideas. But how could I capture those changes in a compelling and persuasive way for readers? So I had read a wonderful book, Age of Fracture by the Princeton historian Dan Rogers, maybe like a decade or so ago. 
And Dan argues that American political culture took a decisive shift in the 1970s. And to show that dramatic change in kind of broad brushstrokes, he used his opening chapter to narrate the inaugural speeches of American presidents from Truman to Reagan. And as it happened, they looked entirely different over time, but not just in content, in vocabulary and sensibility. I thought it was a great way to set his argument in motion. And so I wondered like, what would be the equivalent of presidential inaugural speeches in the global sphere? And then I remembered the annual ritual of world leaders coming to the United Nations in New York in September to make an address before the General Assembly. Every September, they come. The record of this now 70-year-old rhetorical practice might be one way, I thought, to capture the global zeitgeist at discrete moments in time and to begin to uncover a kind of lexicon of the global South. So I've been reading and analyzing September speeches for some time now, not all of them, some of them. And the full text of these speeches can really be quite marvelous. So the contrast between, this is Castro in uh, 1960, and this is the Malaysian premier, um, Mahathir Mohammed in 2018. Castro in 1960 gave the longest September speech ever given at the UN, clocking in at 269 minutes. 269 minutes. There's a lot of stamina there. Now, Mahathir, fast forward, September 2018, 10 minutes. He's up, he's down, it's over. And so, you know, just thinking about shifts in form content as one era moves to another era, again, the actual texture of the speeches gets you into territory that's useful to think of in one form or another. But, you know, there are a lot of these speeches, like a lot of these speeches. And so I turn to methods from the digital humanities to go a bit deeper in with the help of a talented group of undergraduate and doctoral researchers at uh, Chicago, I've built a corpus of more than 10,000 of the annual September UN speeches from 1946 to 2020, to in a sense map the key words that made up the eras of the third world and the global south in an effort to trace how conceptions of global politics changed across time and space over this 70 year period. I draw on machine learning and data visualization. I say that like I really know all of that. I'm, it's emergent for me, but those are the tools that I'm building on to essentially read the entire corpus with an eye toward focusing the frequency, emotional intensity, and relational patterns of the keywords that emerge in them. And these tools help you to do some of that. The changes are dramatic and they speak to the importance, I think, of rupture for understanding the history of the Global South. What you see here is a kind of taste of key words from the two eras. And I wanna draw attention to three major ruptures around subjects, issue areas, and conceptual frames of global political intervention. With subjects, we see a kind of growing plurality. So collectivities in the form of the state or the people were central to the language of the era of the third world. But now in the era of the global south, individuals and their subjectivities along with non-governmental organizations have also become primary subjects in the new politics. At the same time, the category of the individual in the global south time widens out beyond the nation state. Um, given the attention in these speeches to such questions as migratory labor, diasporic populations, refugees, and human trafficking. The issues of concern look different too between the two eras, with gender, the environment, climate, human rights, racism, and sexuality taking on unprecedented levels of attention and significance in the era of the global South. Finally, and most importantly from my perspective, is the rise of new ontological categories at the turn of the millennium that fundamentally reordered how actors in both the global North and the global South thought about the political and the social. Among them, novel conceptions of justice, sustainability, resilience, heritage, and capability. Now, 
I want to give full credit to the digital humanities for kind of getting me here, but in truth, unpacking each of these ontological transformations for my book has sent me back to old fashioned historical methods, basically close readings of key texts. So let me give you a quick sense here of how I do that for one of these novel conceptualizations, that's capabilities. Because in fact, capabilities is one of the most ubiquitous key words that begins to emerge in these new vocabularies of the global South. So where did the idea of capabilities come from and how does it represent an ontological shift? All right, this is kind of fun. It was all quite simple, really at least for those for whom statistics and mathematical formulas come easily, as I'm sure they do to everyone in this room, just like me. In 1990, a team of social scientists from the Global South came to believe that development could be precisely measured and um, compared by country. So as you see here, you know, you just calculate the, the deprivations around life expectancy, literacy, and income, you add them up, subtract from one and like magic, you've got a measure of human development in a particular place and a particular time. This formula was proposed by the Pakistani economist Mahbub al haq and the Nobel Prize winning Indian economist Amartya Sen. Um, that's Sen, that's Haq. Their revolutionary project sought to overturn what had been commonsensical notions about the sources of inequality and with it challenging the ways in which global economic development had been conceived over the previous half century. Increases in income, more precisely gross national product or GNP, had been the dominant measures of development since the 1930s. For Hawkinson, however, access to income was a necessary but ultimately insufficient lens to understand the nature of human development. They saw income as a means, not an end. Development, they argued, should be more concerned with, quote, enhancing the lives we lead and the freedoms we enjoy in a continual process of enlarging people's choices. Hawkinson acknowledged that development required a decent standard of living, but at the same time insisted that the conditions that led to a long and healthy life and the ability to acquire knowledge were just as important. In measuring the formation and cultivation of what they called essential capabilities, Hawkinson began to reimagine the determinants of economic and social progress. We need a measure, Hawk told Sen really bluntly as they started the project, at the same level of vulgarity as GNP, just one number, but a measure that is not as blind to the social aspects of human lives as GNP is. In developing their indexical measures, Hawk, Sen, and their team wanted to get inside the processes of development and offer fundamentally new perspectives on what they believed to be its proper ends and means. Their human development project was based at the United Nations, which admittedly is not usually seen as a hotbed of intellectual originality. But in this case, Hock and Sen were granted unusual independence and freedom in the work that they did. And the project became an innovative laboratory that pushed out a veritable caravan of new thinking about development. Over the course of the 90s, Hawkinson annually produced a report on human development to accompany the statistics and measures that made up their index. They started with a relatively tight index. That was the formula that you saw at the beginning. The concerns were around life expectancy, education, and income. But over time, these increasingly widely influential reports were among the first to identify environmental sustainability and human rights as critical factors in the making of development policy. They also pioneered discussions of the relationship between gender and development, eventually producing additional indexes that plotted the empowerment of women. Most fundamentally, Hawkinson helped to put the South at the center of global conversations in the 1990s about the kinds of lives people wanted to lead. Capabilities was the key, that was at the core of these efforts. Sen often drew attention in his writings to Aristotle, who at the beginning of his ethics wrote, quote, wealth is evidently not the good we are seeking, for it is merely useful and for the sake of something else. Hawk and Sen sought to understand what we can do with more wealth. For them, the answer was the expansion of the capabilities of individuals who, as they put it, 
lead the lives that they value. It was not just in the world of political and social theory that Southern voices became visible and influential in the 1990s and early 2000s. Southern culture, as I said at the outset, increasingly transformed world culture over this same period of time. And that shift emerged most dramatically in the realm of global visual culture. And I wanna go there now to give you a sense of how the visual played a central role in the creation of a new Southern facing global culture. Quote, one of the problematic aspects of visiting museums, art galleries, and other sites of cultural valuation in Europe and the United States, wrote the curator Oakley and Weiser in the fall of 1994, is the pervasive absence of art by contemporary African artists. He might have noted a similar absence of contemporary artists from the Middle East and much of Asia as well. The Global South was largely invisible at the beginning of the 1990s in the international art world, reflecting decades, if not centuries, of curatorial practices in which work by Western masters dominated the walls of European and American museums and galleries. In the mid-20th century, and particularly after uh, 1960, the work of some Japanese, Korean, and Latin American artists entered these collections, but they were the exceptions that confirmed and Wieser's broader observations. The 1990s were a kind of tipping point, and in the new millennium, visual artists from across the global south moved from the margins to the forefront of venerable Western cultural institutions, and over time would come to dominate a growing set of newly built museums and exhibition spaces in the South itself. One of them, um, M Plus in Hong Kong, which just opened a few years ago, um, is Asia's first global museum of contemporary visual culture. But this is one of a kind of phalanx of these institutions opening in the spaces of the global South in recent years. Now, like my examination of the intellectual histories of new textual vocabularies from the South, what I'm keen to explore here are the ways in which visual culture was also a central element in the new ontologies of being in the world that have emerged in the Global South. To flesh that out just a little bit for you, I wanna offer a brief discussion of the career of Okuyan Wieser. I love this photograph of him, as he was a central figure in these remarkable transformations. When he first leveled his critique of European and American museums, he was virtually unknown in global art circles. He was born in 1963 to a prosperous Igbo family in Southeast Nigeria. He lived through the massive disruptions of the Biafran War between 1967 and 1970 that forced his family to relocate more than 45 times. And Wizard decided to leave Nigeria when he was 18 years old. And he moved to New York for college at Jersey State and he supported himself as a waiter and a security guard. But he also wrote experimental poetry, and he increasingly hung out in your old neck of the woods, Monica, below 14th Street, with writers and musicians from the African diaspora. And Wieser noticed that the city's major galleries never showed any contemporary African art at all, and he began looking for curatorial opportunities in a museum environment that was slowly growing more sensitive to mounting criticisms about its Western bias. Within two years, and Wieser organized what was lauded as a landmark show of African photography at the Guggenheim. And from there, he went on to curate the Johannesburg Biennale in 1998, where quite interestingly and simply by chance, a few blocks away from the exhibition site, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission was first beginning its work. A year later, Anne Wieser was appointed as the first artistic director from the Global South of Documenta, the art exhibition that I opened my talk with. It was Anne Wieser's Documenta 11 in 2002 that I think dramatically reversed traditional art world geographies by putting a new generation of contemporary visual artists from the Global South at the center of the exhibition. More than half of the 117 artists had ties to the Global South. And Wieser's ambition at Documenta 11 was to create a global post-colonial spectacle. The artists he invited most often worked in the new canonical mediums of contemporary art, so installation, performance, and video. 
and in grand Biennale style, and Wieser spread their work out over multiple venues in Kassel to explore what he called the double move of the post-colonial world under globalization. Many of the artists at Documenta 11 grappled with the meanings of everyday life in the global South. Others were keen to explore the implications of the growing presence of former colonial subjects in majority white Europe. And Wieser further extended the idea of Biennales as a kind of mobile global platform by organizing companion events in Delhi, in St. Lucia, in Lagos, in Berlin, and in Vienna in the 18 months leading up to Documenta. And they drew together academics, policymakers, artists for symposiums to considered questions of transitional justice, contemporary urban life, and the future of democracy. And so in them, you know, public policy and art were being deliberately intertwined. The exploration of transitional justice, again, which was sort of moving on the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, involved writers, philosophers, historians, psychoanalysts, lawyers, and judges to talk about the ways in which commissions like the one in South Africa um, essentially could move forward for people to think in different terms about what restorative justice looked like. Many of Documenta 11's artists had biographies like and Wieser himself, 30-somethings who were a part of a growing diaspora of the global South in the United States and in Europe. Um, others were of the same generational cohort, but they were more firmly rooted in the global South itself, although their growing international practices meant that they were often on the move. The Indian-based uh, Amar Kanwa, Kanwa, excuse me, um, he was born in New Delhi in 1964 and later trained there in documentary filmmaking. And Kanwar's work has explored ecological devastation, sexual violence, and the suppression of minority communities. His elegaic A Season Outside at Documenta 11, and there are two clips from me here, was part of a trilogy that focused on the relationship between India and Pakistan after the partition that came with the independence from Great Britain in 1947. Evoking the anxieties of the militarized border between the two countries, the film begins with what was a daily sunset ritual of the closing of the gate at a major border crossing between India and Pakistan, where army personnel and police on both sides, and you can see that here, um, engaged in incredibly theatrical displays of nationalist aggression um, before crowds of spectators. So you see the spectators, you see in a sense, I, mean, I wish I had a kind of moving image of this because you get a better sense about it, but that's, that's yeah, yeah. There is perhaps no border outpost in the world quite like this one, Kanwar says early on in the film, an outpost where every evening people are drawn to a thin white line. In part, the 30-minute film offered a critique of the rise of contemporary Hindu nationalism and its encouragement of communal violence. But it also spoke to more interior concerns. Over footage of the daily stage conflict at the border, Hanwar quietly suggested that the violence had occurred in his own family too. Quote, probably anyone in the eye of a conflict could find themselves here, he argued in an effort to use the physical space of the border to point toward the ways in which pervasive physical aggression can entangle both individuals and nations. Without doubt, Documenta 11 was a transformative moment for global culture. It was indeed a revolution, wrote the celebrated Chilean-born artist Alfredo Jarre, who showed his work there. The art world, Jarre continued, was never the same. The exhibition solidified and Wieser's status as one of the most important voices in the world of visual art. And in its wake, he regularly appeared on these annual lists of the 100 most influential people in the art world until his untimely death from cancer in 2017. The transformative influence of Documenta went far deeper than in Wieser's own career trajectory. And it did solidify a major realignment in the making of cultural power. It punctuated, as one leading arts journal later claimed, the emergence of the South as a global cultural movement. 
And Wee Face Happy Mentor was a harbinger of an even bigger wave that brought the work and ideas of artists from the global south to growing international audiences in our present moment. In writing these new histories of global visual culture for my book, I trace a group of artists and curators from the global south who were, to quote the name of one of the biggest blockbuster traveling international shows of the 1990s, quote, on the move. And as I do so, I'll explore the impact of their work and ideas as they traveled between and across Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and the Americas. By way of conclusion, I'd like to return to the anchoring image I used to frame the talk. This is Yinke Shanabare's Girl on a Globe Two. I should say that Shanabare's work was in Ann Weiser's Documenta 11, though not this particular piece. The work of the Nigerian-born and now London-based Shanabare is most distinctively marked by his use of brilliantly colored Dutch wax print cotton, a fabric inspired by Indonesian batiks, but machine-made in the Netherlands. The biggest market for the fabric was not apparently in Indonesia, where many consumers saw the mass-produced cloth by their former colonizers as inauthentic, but instead in Western Africa. In the 1960s, it became a new symbol of African independence and identity, and later in the United States among Black Americans as a sign of African heritage and solidarity. Shotobare bought the cloth in outdoor markets around London, and he used it to drape the headless figures that form the center of much of his sculptural practice. To an extent, Girl on a Globe confirms the importance of continuity in writing about the Global South. The epigons of the imperial and the third world are all present in this work, just as they are throughout the intellectual histories of the Global South. In this piece, for example, the circularities of the synthetic Dutch wax fabric cannot be understood outside the conditions of high imperialism and the unequal structures of the political economy that shaped everyday life in and after empire, along with the revolutionary politics of solidarity in the third world. But at the same time, Girl on a Globe offers a kind of visual talisman for what I see as the ruptures and new vocabularies that were also central to the making of the Global South at the close of the 20th century. Let's start with the globe that the girl is somewhat precariously standing upon. The surface of the globe is shaded with colors that indicate zones of warming, indicators of environmental change. Shinobare based the color shading on an infrared heat map of the world that indicates the regimes of the world most affected by climate change, most notably in the global south. To step back and, you know, extrapolate just a bit, in these dimensions of Girl on a Globe, we get a sense of the environment as a conceptual category, a visceral sense of climate change and a hint perhaps of the perils of ignoring ideas about sustainability. All key words that I believe took shape and form in the late 20th century global south. And what about the headless body of the girl? So one might parse that in a number of ways. The headless figure I think could be most readily seen as a kind of erasure of identity. But I wanna go almost in the opposite direction to suggest that the absence of a head puts the focus on the body and its sensorium. Politics with a capital P, political economy, social life, even environmental change are refracted through the lens of the individual body. The individual, the body, its life conditions, its capabilities, were among the critical markers of what I think it meant to rethink ontological states of being in the global south. The turn to the global south has brought a sweeping transformation in the subject, objects, and conceptual frame that mark global political, economic, social, and cultural life in the early 21st centuries in the south and in the global north. Whether it be a UN September speech, the construction of the Human Development Index, Okwi and Weiser and Ruin Grupa's documentas, or work by Ai Weiwei 
Amar Kanwar and Yinke Shonabare, these are the places where the rise, circulation, and impact of new ways of being in the world were made at the turn of the millennia. Together, they create the conditions of possibility that shape the power of the imaginary we call the global south. Thank you. I'm still figuring all this out. So I'm looking forward to hearing people's questions, comments, observations. Yes, please. Yeah, I mean, it's like the heart of the challenge yeah. of the project in a way. I can't. I think it's trying to be unless I found um, what's the relationship between continuity and what's the relationship between change and the story. And you could cut that in a variety of different ways. I I was struck, I mean, I came into this project initially through coming to learn about contemporary visual art, which I didn't know a lot about before I began. And I did, I think to myself, you know, Picasso was there in the 20th century and now Ira Ray is here in the 21st century. And like, that's a fundamental transformation of the way in which global visual culture works. And so something had to really change for that to be the case, right? So it was kind of like just a simple thing, you know, in a way, like how, how could you get from there to there if it was just about, you know, a kind of slow drift from one thing to another thing. So it does seem to me that, you know, people talk about justice in different kinds of ways. People talk about sustainability in ways that they hadn't before. It's not entirely like a South dialogue that's not connected to the North. And, you know, you know, evening talk, you, you, you draw the lines hard, right? But there's, you know, there's a dialogue that's going on back and forth. But just that these voices, as it turns out, were more central maybe than people had thought coming into it. But on the continuity side, like I really like, and one of the things I say in the talk is that it's useful to think about the end of the Cold War and perhaps the end of the third world as an imaginary, as a process of decomposition, rather than a kind of, you know, it's like that one day and it's like that the other day. And it's, it's Hanek Kwan who works um, in really interesting ways on the Cold War, who has this notion about decomposition. And I, I think it's the most fruitful way to think in some ways about what's sort of happening late 20th century. So it lets you acknowledge that things are being pulled forward, but it also lets you try to surface what seem to be elements of change. And I think one of the big elements of change, and you know, it's hard, it's hard to make these claims in certain kinds of ways. Like something was happening at the end of the 20th century 
about the really who had authority to talk and how people talked about politics, morality, culture, society, and the whole notion of lived experience and testimonial, some of which comes out as kind of a global circulation of human rights practices and languages in that period of time, really fundamentally shift, like the culture of experts that we all think as a kind of like World War II through, you know, 60s sort of thing. Like now, I mean, think about it now. Nobody could care less about an expert, right? It's, you know, people's own experience is what motivates people along. That happened, I think, in a profound way in this sort of late 20th century period. That then manifests itself in complicated, sometimes appealing, sometimes less appealing <laughs> sorts of political claims that get made out in the world. But if you look at the work, particularly of visual artists, it is a claim that's being made from experience. That's the way, you know, the way in which Tamara is talking about that line on the border. You know, he wants to talk about it. He wants to let you know that that is happening in that space. Like, that's a precondition. So, like, it has to be described. But then he wants to talk about where that takes him. And where that takes him is back to his family and back to a family history of violence that was entangled in, you know, what was going on in 1947. And so, you know, he comes out in a very different place than one might have, you know, at an earlier period of time and the kinds of claims that you would take that way. So it's, it's delicate, you know, and I, when I first started giving these talks, I don't know, like two or three years ago, I would just say to people, okay, relax the whole notion that there's any continuity. Let's just pretend there's no continuity. And all we're going to do is talk about rupture. Because like, I kind of had to do that in my head for a while to get there. Now I feel like I've got a handle kind of on, you know, what that's about. And I feel like I can let continuity back, <laughs> you know, back into the story a little bit. But I don't want it, again, it's a delicate balance between the two because I don't want the one to, to swamp the other necessarily. But again, decomposition turned out to be a real through line for me intellectually in thinking out, you know, what that transformation looked like in real time um, in the late 20th century which is different than World War II, because that is, the image is so like, it's a new world, which of course is an early issue anyway, but you know, but that's the, that's the way in which people think about it. I don't know if that helps, yeah. but it's just like, I haven't, I, that's what I will keep working out as I keep writing. And the place I get to, I'm sure can be a little bit different from the place I presented to you tonight, but yeah. Oh, sorry. Here, this one. Yep. Here we go. I don't know if it's coming. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, I um, really appreciated this talk, and I think I'm. I, I like. I mean, I want to continue with uh, where you left off, and and I I think. I, I see where you're going with the rupture. Um, and um, what I want to do is ask you a little bit more about the significance of the rupture. Mm -hmm. um, and it has to do with what you're calling the ontological shift. Mm -hmm. Because they, they seem, and, and because the, the, the key ontological category uh, here seems to be something like capability and, 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 and a number of, of other categories. But the way you're getting at these ontological categories seems to be through the way people are talking. So, so a discursive shift is happening, which suggests to me that when you're talking about ontolo ontology, you're really presupposing a certain kind of epistemological shift. Mm -hmm. So it's the way in which people are looking at things. And that, is, that seems to be producing the ontology. So let me explain why I think that might be significant. Mm -hmm. As I was listening to the talk, it seemed like what I was waiting for, and, and, and it didn't quite come, was the critique. Yes. Um, because behind all these epistemological and ontological shifts is the shift from a state-centered capitalism to neoliberal capitalism. Yep. And if you don't have the critique, what, what the talk is going to sound like is a celebration of our times yep. where, ah, the global South has come in. But 
the problem is the, the way in which the global south comes in is so overdetermined by the shifts in global, global capitalism that it sort of undermines the, the agency that you're trying to see in, in the global mm -hmm. south. So mm -hmm. let me, let's just take the example of Ai Weiwei because it came up again and again. I mean, Ai Weiwei is obviously a global figure right now and he comes from the global south. But when I go to China, the, the people who are really pro Ai Weiwei are, are the people who are extremely pro-American as well, often. Uh, the, the real left, I wonder how much they're really into Ai Weiwei. I mean, the new left is not that into Ai Weiwei. I mean, so, so that would be the, the case. I mean, this, this actually is very similar to the post-colonial intellectual, right? So that what you can do is celebrate post-colonialism, but then on the other hand, but you have to at least acknowledge the Marxist critique of that, which says that what happens here is you have the global, the intellectual who comes to the global south, but, and, but the minute they come into that center, they're in some sense creating for another. So, 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 so I think that, that I think brings in a host of other issues, such as the link between neoliberalism and imperialism, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and that whole, so it, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, maybe that's coming, that's the next part of the, the project, but. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the other complicated set of issues to sort out in this. So if, um, so, yeah. Um, you know, if rupture is one, then the nature of the rupture is the other. I don't, the neoliberal is there. You and I probably are gonna differ on the level of determinism that one would draw from that, and that's fine, right? Um, but it wasn't in the talk. Again, you know what you can do in two minutes. But I am concerned about trying to think about that in more layered sorts of ways. And so Ai Weiwei, in effect, isn't really my case for this. But what I didn't talk about today in our part of the project is that I've done a pretty deep case examination of the kind of making of contemporary art in Indonesia and in Thailand in the 1990s. And I've tried to trace out a whole set of levels by which people are simultaneously engaging. And so in both Indonesia and Thailand in the 1990s, there is, I mean, this way of you know, thinking about installation, thinking about you know, the, the kind of display that is contemporary art is emerging in these spaces in, in kind of powerful ways. It is emerging in ways that challenge certain sets of cultural power dynamics within society. It is often um, deployed in ways that essentially do operate around neoliberal critiques of a set of practices that are happening in both Indonesia and in Thailand. But the same figures move. They move regionally for the first time in the 1990s. And, and one of the things like this whole notion about the decomposition is that in Southeast Asia, you could, people just weren't on the move in the same kinds of ways in Cold War era time as they were post-Cold War era time. It was just the ability to move was different. And so there are these regional exhibitions that emerge in Australia and emerge in Japan in this period of time. And these are some of the artists, they're operating in a local space. They then move into this kind of regional space. As they move into the regional space, and I've you know, spoken with a number of them, one of the things that they consistently tell me is that we had no idea that in Bangkok or in Chiang Mai, you were thinking around some of the same issues that we were thinking about in Jogja. You know, it's just that level of communication didn't happen for whatever reason in a way that's kind of hard to believe today, you know, because that's not that hard to do, but it was then, you know, and that's a, a historical condition of the moment. So there was something about these regional things that also did a certain work in a kind of local space. 
And then it's from those regional platforms that people then kind of move into this more sort of global circulation. And I think the way really to address the issue that you're talking about most usefully is to think about a layered case like that, where people are moving across time and space, are operating again with a variety of agendas. And that's a way of being able to layer the neoliberal without my, I mean, my fear about it is, is that if the neoliberal swamps it all, then what's going on in terms of the creativity of these individual artists also gets swamped. They are just spokespeople, mouthpieces, you know, whatever. And I don't think that's true. The people that I met are some of the most remarkably creative people I have ever met in my life. And you know that you don't have to go to the global south to do that. There are Madison artists who are just as talented and smart, right? And that they're not puppets of some kind of you know theoretical system. They're real, and they're trying to figure it out. And I think part of this project is to try to sit with them and to think with them about what that meant. I'm not sure when I'm operating in different spaces. So you know the critique of the Human Development Index. I didn't talk about here. There's a whole lot. That, and that's an easy one in a way. Um, you know, sustainability is more complex than trying to think about what the critiques of that might be. The critiques of restorative justice, I think, are more complex. It's it's the the Amartya Sen stuff that needs more nuance than I was giving today, for sure. But in these other realms, I think, you know, it's also, it's the tension in a way, you know? And what I did was just push the whole thing away, as you rightly said. But when you bring it back in, I think it's in trying to figure out the tension, at least that I want to try to go through. Yes. No. Oh, sorry. Hi, Mark. This was such a compelling talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not going to ask you about the Human Development Index because we just said that you. Uh, but I have two questions, and one of them is about the image the Shanibari image that you showed us. And apart from the, the textile, I'm very, very, you know, taken by the style of the dress. It seems very much to be inspired by the high noon of colonialism with a bustle. The shoe she is wearing are Converse shoes. And instead of standing, you know, in an unsteady position, it seems like she's trying to run away somewhere. I'm wondering if I'm reading too much into this, and I was just wondering if you could <laughs> tell us a little more about it. The second question, of course, you know, such a such a fascinating topic. The world went south, but when you talk about documenta, it seems the world is coming back to the north for the south and visual cultures of the south to find that kind of validation that a new era of the south had begun. You still need the space to be in the global north. You still need the institutions of the global north. And unless the exhibition is there in multiple places, it doesn't seem as if that creativity is finding any sort of validation. And again, it's so interesting that Rongropa, you know, the member, has to stand in front of the German parliament yeah. and actually has to answer as to why certain things might or might not have happened, right? And I'm just wondering, what do we make of it? And this brings us to the question of the rupture versus the continuity. Mm -hmm. Is this essentially a continuity cloaked in celebration of the Global South in a way then? And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it. Thank you yeah. so much. It was yeah, a brilliant yeah. talk. You know, what happens what happened to Documenta is far from a celebration. And what happens last year at Documenta is, is how fragile this notion is of what the relationship might be of Southern culture in a kind of, you know, Northern culture. And the, I only said a little bit about what the controversy was about. But that committee of experts essentially was like a vetting committee of entirely European curators who went project by project by project. There were hundreds of them to make sure there were no problems, right? So there was a kind of surveillance that was going on beyond this and, and a frustration, I think, on the part of Rungrupa around, you know, what that meant. Um, it's like, 
when I met them in Jakarta, they were one that Ade has sorted the spokesperson, you know, and I, I don't know if I can get them. Can I get these slides back? Just there was that picture of them like at the beginning. If you can go back there. Um, I don't, it, like he would, it, it didn't surprise me that he was the one who had to go to the German parliament, like that's something that he could do. But there were several other members who are in that picture that I met. No, oh, it's, I'm sorry, it's the, all the way back. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So that, this is Ade who was speaking to the German parliament. Um, and this is Farid who ooh, they would not have had speaking to the German parliament because it's, he just was more plain spoken about what was going on. And when I met him in in Jakarta, you know, basically he said, so what they've decided is that it isn't working for them anymore. They need us to make it work. So we're going to do that and we're going to do it just the way we want to do it. And in a way, I think anticipating it wasn't going to go smoothly, right? It's not just that it was art as collective. It's not just... It, it was a whole set of things that it was too much, you know. Um, there was an excess to it, but they they knew that, and that's what they were that they were pushing against. So there's a friction. I mean, all these cases, right? In what Louise is identifying, I think, in what you're identifying, what you're, there's just a friction there that I'm smoothing over in this talk in ways that I'm realizing I need to stop smoothing. But it's in the friction, in effect, that you start to see what it's about right and it isn't the one or the other it's the complicated dynamics of the moment but i do think there's something new in the way in which that friction is being exercised in one form or another Trinabare, um it's you're right to notice the bustle um so the early the earlier work he did work that was in this um and music documenta went back to the 18th century and early 19th century around a variety of colonial practices. Um, and some were sort of high empire kinds of practices, some were sort of everyday practices, but the, the kind of shaping of the clothes had a, had a sort of late 18th century, early 19th century kind of look. For some reason that carries over with Girl on a Globe, even though he sort of had moved in some ways, I think, away from that, but I think just the sort of self-presentation of the kind of sculptural mannequins, that, that's the continuity over time, which does, I mean, in thinking about continuity and change, push it back to, right, 18th century, 19th century. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's a continuity argument, not necessarily a rupture argument. There was something in between that I'm forgetting. Again, it, it's hard with art <laughs> to see it, well, no, to see it still. Like one of the things I've realized is that you, you have to go to a Biennale to get what a Biennale is about. And it's really very difficult to describe what the kind of sensibility is. And with individual pieces of art, like if I'm in somebody's studio and they're sort of walking me through something, Again, it's a different sort of thing than, you know, you're sitting in a museum. When I saw that at the National Gallery in um, Girl on a Globe in DC, it looked precarious to me. That's how it felt in the moment. I can see what, and, and maybe if you'd been sitting in the gallery, you would have said, no, Mark, she's, she's just, she's moving along, right? You know, and we could have had a conversation about that, right? But I think it's harder, you can't see motion and you can't really see three dimensionality without being in the space. And, and that's kind of like another thing about this project that I have a certain amount of trouble with. Like art people write about art in certain kinds of ways. But one thing that they don't do is they don't do a lot of thick description. You know, it's sort of, it's there, everybody's seen it. I don't really need to talk about it. But I feel like in our world, we haven't seen it and you kind of do know, need to know palpably what it's about. But again, this kind of three-dimensional work is hard. I think video work is particularly hard to give you a sense, you know, about what what unfolds. Um, performance is the hardest, you know, of all, I think, to sort of convey in, in one form or another. And if you're thinking about writing a book, and part of the 
people you're writing about do performance art and people don't really know what a performance looks like. And the book is not a video, it's a book. You know, you just have to kind of start to think about writing strategies in some ways that begin to, you know, to do what you can in that kind of way. Um, so you may be right, you may be fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Patrick, you wanna? My question was similar to Viren, so perhaps it's it's repetitive. But it, the what I was wondering was the relationship between economic changes that are happening at the global level and the analysis that you're putting forward. Um, I was looking as you were as Viren was asking the question. You were standing there beneath the slide, and the title. It seemed to me that the title of your talk and the subtitle could have been the titles of a talk given by an economist. That you know, when the when the world went south, and then this this is about the rise of the south, and this is at the end of the Cold War. This is, we're we're what we're observing shifts in global production and distribution, and indeed, in many of the cases, although I'm sure it's not true of all of the cases, the places where you showed artists working are, uh, you know, fantastically cosmopolitan and wealthy cities. Mm -hmm. Something that also wouldn't perhaps have been uh the landscape in which people were working in a previous era so uh well i'm not trying to impose a kind of materialistic <laughs> reading of things and i know that you're you uh you are analyzing the economic uh what's the right word for the human development index it's like the frameworks or concepts economic concepts within economics um What's the relationship between the, okay, if you'll forgive me, the, between the base and the superstructure here? <laughs> uh, I, need, I think I'm gonna need a mic for that one, Patrick. <laughs> so just to say, for people in the room who might not know the intellectual genealogies that link the three of us, there's a, a, a historian that was very important to the three of us at Chicago, Moshe Bristow, who passed away uh, a couple of years ago. And I gotta say, you know, I often think to myself, Moshe would just roll his eyes about this project, right? You know, because it would be the same thing. What in the world, Mark? How can you not, you know? So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll do a facetious thing and I'll do a more serious thing. I, so I sat in our dean's office in the social sciences for the last five years, and I've seen a lot of economist titles on their thesis and in their books. I haven't seen this one. So I'm not so not totally sure that that, that one aligns. Um, but, yeah, yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know, you know, one of the things One of the things that I always struggled about in my relationship with Moish was that I just didn't really see the world the way Moish saw the world. And that he was very eloquent about being able to articulate the world that he saw. And I was less so. Um, and I guess to me, let's go back to the artist because that, that's where I feel like I have the, the best sense to the extent that one can have a sense of, you know, people and, and who they are. Um, yeah, they, they occupied cosmopolitan spaces, but they occupied anti-cosmopolitan spaces. They just occupy space. They want to do what they want to do. And you can say that what they want to do, they're somehow trapped in a superstructure, but I don't really think that's so. I think they want to do what they want to do. And they might want to do it at an alternative Biennale in the streets of Jogja, as they did in 1992, or they might do it at Documenta, you know? But it doesn't, the cosmopolitanness of 
the place where it's happening, as I talk to people, doesn't seem to be that significant to them. However, there are artists, and again, I, I can just speak sort of Indonesia, Thailand, so I, I don't want to extrapolate beyond that, but there are artists that don't move into orbit. So the world, in, what, what art historians say is that these are orbital artists that you know come up, pop up, and then start to move. There are plenty of artists who don't become orbital. And they have a critique around what's happening with these artists that actually sounds a little bit like yours. And that's a little hard to parse out too, because are they right? Or did they actually want to be orbital and it didn't work out for whatever reason, right? Because, you know, the sort of psychology of all this may be just as important as the base or the superstructure, right? Um, so I, I guess where I think I can go in more three-dimensional ways is around the artist themselves. I think that's going to be much harder for me in these sort of social theory chapters. It's easy to critique the human development index. I got that critique. I've read Bruno Latour, you know, like I can go there. Um, and I will, but I, I, I can't really get inside um, Amartya Sen, you know. Um, I've talked to him, you know, but in a kind of the way you do talk to somebody like that, right? Um, so I think that's just going to be a challenge as as I go with some of the political and social theory chapters. But I think the opportunity, like the on the ground work, you know, 100 artists and curators over a period of time in a very definite space, that's a Southeast Asian space, Indonesia and Thailand, you do get a sense, right? And I think that's what I'm going to have to convey to readers to make it seem convincing to them. And I don't think the kind of issues that you're raising are, you know, I'm not going to satisfy that totally, but I think those stories may help people understand better, you know, what, at least from the perspective, as best I can reconstruct it, of the experiential nature of what it meant to live in that period of the 1990s for them, felt like, was like. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I guess first off, I'll say that what I do appreciate about the kind of provocation about continuity and rupture that you're posing is that it helps us actually completely sidestep such an old and um, totally unproductive uh, story or question about the third world was, which is, you know, whether or not it was successful. Right, or mm -hmm. like, was it a failed project, right? Which we all know and recent scholarship has shown like that that just doesn't help us arrive anywhere actually in terms of really thinking through justice in the long term, right? Um, and also I think that it helps us sidestep um, kind of the focus of thinking about the third world, sorry, vision um, as one exclusively about state building, right? And I wonder if when, when you talk about the rupture, and I really, again, appreciated focusing on the 1980s and early 90s in terms of what's happening, especially in Asia, right, um, with the anti-military authoritarian um, kind of movements. I wonder if one thing that um, maybe people are kind of, at least for me, <laughs> was very present as you moved into the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, certainly kind of what Viren was talking about in terms of neoliberalism, but also because we're talking about art, I just kept on thinking about the commercialization, yep. right? Yep. Um, and sort of, I'm assuming the kind of savvy, right? Um, because the commercialization is potentially continuity of age-old Orientalism, <laughs> American capitalism, that we're very familiar with in terms of global circuits, right, around art. Um, so I was wondering, like, two things. Um, how do you see how these artists are taking up, let's say, that particular idea about capabilities as a way of um, helping us think through um, late 90s, early 2000s, in terms of uh, what is happening 
with um, post-colonial imperial capitalism, right? Um, and also um, the actual genre of um, these, uh, these art forms, right? The Biennale, mm -hmm. right? That this seems to also be a really important thing. Maybe like, I'm not familiar with that, right? Um, but it seems like so much of what Ruang Bukba does and also the Biennales and the tension perhaps that happens, right? When they're in the global North is about a kind of experiential um, kind of politics that is supposed to be ephemeral, <laughs> right? And is supposed yeah. to, so there's something here, I guess, about a, a politics that they seem to be perhaps um, presenting to us, right? That is supposed to be inherently unstable and inherently, you know, kind of impossible to capture perhaps, right? And you have to experience that to kind of understand how that is, a somatic, right? Mm -hmm. Psychological, right? So it seems how to say um, that the, again, just for me, that what I want more from um, just to hear from you is kind of how these artists perhaps um, through these kind of installations, the Biennales, they're getting at different kinds of scales actually, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of what they're presenting about Ruang Rupa's, for example, today's injustices, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that quite makes mm. sense, but um, again, that's that's kind of what I, I found myself really kind of <laughs> yeah. wanting to hear more about. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's super helpful, Monica. Um, two, two things. So on the kind of objects as, you know, I don't know, sort of neoliberal, under reward, you know, whatever. Um, there is a complicated relationship between the art market and, and these artists, as, as, as you might imagine. It Again, the interesting thing to me in the 1990s is it's not at all clear what that is. And so it's working itself out in that moment. And in some ways, it does look like an earlier time. But in some ways, it doesn't. And so as an example of how it doesn't. And now I'm going to borrow my colleague, um, Kimberly Huang's book, Spiderweb Capitalism. So Kimberly has been writing about venture capitalists in um, the global South. Um, and both American and European capitalists, but then also, you know, who it would be internally, who would be building out markets in one form or another. And she was, um, she did some embedding of her own. So she was, you know, sitting with these firms. And, and one of the things that came up was like, what gifts get given in these situations? And so the, the most classic gift, apparently, it's not a world that I know all that much about, was that they're, they're extremely expensive like purses, right? And that you would give the extremely expensive purse and that that would be the gift that would, and there's an, a set of things like that. But over time, people started giving contemporary art of the region to people, but nobody wanted it. But they knew, well, they didn't want to display it. So the purses actually, Kimberly says, people would display the purses in, in a variety of ways, right? As you would expect. But they didn't want to display any of that contemporary art on their walls. So in Switzerland, apparently there are miles of lockers where people just put it. And the hope is, you know, over time, maybe it appreciates in value and they can sell it up or whatever, but they don't want anything to do with it. That seems different than the politics of display from an earlier era, right? That you would actually want it out there. But this is just more efficient. The Swiss deal with it. You know, you don't have to see it. It's all in, you know, pressure sealed areas. Or... So I, again, this is not my work, it's Kimberly's, but we, when she was telling me about this, I was just totally fascinated that that, you know, would be a way that this would kind of go. Um, is a kind of interesting case. And the fact that Ruin Grupa essentially built 150 other art collectives around itself at this exhibition, most of whom were from the Global South, suggests that they're not alone, right? That part of what they wanted to do was build a sort of solidarity. But it wasn't 
you know, the individual artist was submerged in all of this, right? And that doesn't happen at Biennale. I mean, basically it's the artist, right? So they, they emerge on the scene in Jakarta in the, at the end of the 90s, in a sense, in reaction to a set of artists that are becoming orbital. And they have a very different kind of practice. And it's a very, you know, it's a grounded practice. It's participatory. It's, you know, it's, they're not making art in that kind of way that can move to Switzerland in a walker. And that that turns out to be a choice that's being made all over the place at that same period of time. And I think part of what is kind of remarkable about this documenta is so many of those collectives, some of which don't have as long a history as Rome Grupa, but some do the sheer number and power of them, right? But that's a different, that's a sub, that's subversive within the ways in which global political culture would work. And that's why I think ultimately they were too much for the Germans, you know, like, right? Because it just didn't, it wasn't legible to them. It didn't work the way it was supposed to work in one form or another. So, mm -mm. no, it's not, it's not at all, no, no. So one of the things, so I sort of, so this kind of case study chapter that's the 90s in Southeast Asia kind of lands on them as another sort of, another pathway that's emerging at the end of the 90s. But in fact, it's a pathway that a number of artists are going in the early 90s and then they start to move in different kinds of directions. So it's a kind of like return to something and a consistency about something over a period of time that gets almost no international recognition. Nobody had heard of Ruin Grupa, you know, like five years ago. I mean, no one, right? But, you know, in, in this world, right? And then all of a sudden, there they are. But they had a practice that was strong and powerful over a long, long period of time, which, again, I think addresses and complexifies what, what it is that artists are about in this period of time. I've, <laughs> I've only been, I guess, to, I guess I've been to about, well, I'm, I'm going to another one next month, so maybe 10 altogether. Um, but what I've done, which most Biennale, I mean, you know, mostly like it's a spectacle. So people like roll in, they see a couple things, but like what I would do is try to see everything. And it takes just a long time, you know, and you got to kind of sit with this and then you said like, it's a small world. So then, oh, look, it's Curator X who's like here. So then, you know, they talk about like what's going on in this space or that space. Or, but seeing how people, like documenta sits there for a hundred days. At the beginning, there are a lot of people. At the end, there are a lot of people. And in the middle, there's nobody. So it, it's also, you know, a kind of like the spectacle of the moment, but it isn't really like consistent over time in, in a way. And, that dynamic, I think, is interesting too, in a sense. Um, yes, yeah, long, yes, yeah, long, yeah, yeah. But there is just I, short of. I realized at a certain point, like I could look at hundreds of Biennale catalogs, and I had no idea what what like it was about, right? And then you start to go to some, and you start to realize it is a thing, and it is a genre, and you could see why people thought maybe it's gotten tired because actually it's not that different from place to place, the basic structures of it and so on too.